just going to take a few minutes to, or a minute or so to let some of your colleagues join. We have uh, a good amount of attendees who are expected and we want to make sure they don't miss anything. So we'll give it about 30 seconds and then we'll get started. My age was that we would start at 100 and we're at 99. So there we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Navigating Conversations on Anti-Black Racism, Seven Do's and Don'ts. Um, we're here on behalf of the Belonging Project. Um, the Belonging Project is an initiative that was created in order to address um, the effect of um, systemic racism in, in the legal profession and bringing together lots of different entities in order to uh, advance belonging for uh, diverse um, attorneys. And I'm very proud to be here um, to be presenting as a part of this um, initiative, which is extremely important. As we know, um, during uh, downturns and times of, uh, of challenge, um, lawyers of color tend to be detrimentally affected um, by those times. And this is one of the initiatives that is put together in order to um, basically uh, balance that, uh, that, that issue. So let me tell you who I am. So I'm Paula Edgar and I'm a partner in Inclusion Strategy Solutions. I'm from New York City um, and I'm a past president of Metropolitan Black Bar Association, which is the largest black bar uh, in New York State and the multi-time award-winning uh, affiliate of the National Bar Association, of which I'm very proud of. Everything else you see there is essentially my LinkedIn headline and we'll talk deeply about how I would like you to continue to connect with me as we go forward. Um, I, I advance conversations. I help organizations to, to think about their structures, uh, to think about diversity and inclusion, who has access, who belongs and who, and because of cultural fit may not belong um, according to how they are structured. And so, Let's go on. Um, many of you are going to be attorneys. I know there are some folks who said I want to join this, even though I'm not. So um, shout out to everybody who's across there on this Friday afternoon. Um, and thank you for joining us for this important conversation. So I thought I would start by acknowledging that we were not doing okay in terms of uh, black people in the legal profession before everything that's happened in the last six to eight weeks. You see on screen, I like to use headlines to punctuate where we are as a society, where within a lot of our structures, law firms and other legal organizations, uh, there were claims of racial bias. There were uh, inequities that were highlighted. And so when you look at the statistics in terms of um, lawyers of color and particularly black lawyers in our profession, the numbers are extremely low. And so, why are we here now? For eight minutes and 40 seconds, seconds, 46 seconds, I should say, George Floyd was um, murdered at the hands of a police officer. Um, and it shifted our narrative. It shifted pretty much everything um, in which we had felt uh, comfortable discomfort and not being able to, or not having to have consistent dialogues about race. And then because we had this collective experience of witnessing this lynching and also then having to deal with the grief that expounded from that, we are now in this place where we have to have these conversations. And whether you want to, or whether it's being forced on you, or whether you've been having these conversations forever and you're glad now that people want to, now there's this momentum. And, and it's not in an echo chamber, it's, a, it's, it's happening at a time where we as a community are also suffering globally because we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And you think about the experiences of black people within this and particularly black Americans within that. Um, this is challenging, these are challenging times. And so you may have asked yourself, why are we just having a dialogue about conversations on, you know, about racism? We're gonna get into that a little bit more, but um, I would submit for you that there's a need for us to really highlight that black people in this country um, have been mistreated, have been devalued, and we need to think about what we can do about that as members of the legal community and as agents of change. 
Um, I started out and kind of jump right in. I will let you know that I will be telling you um, the CLE code in the middle of the session for those of you who need CLE credit. And if you have questions throughout the session, you're welcome to ask them using the Q and A tab. There's no there's no uh, chat feature. Um, I will review the questions as they come in, or but most of the time at the end of the session um, during the Q and A. And so, getting back to this, I. I want to say to you that even looking at this image um, is challenging for me, and this is the work that I do. And so I know I don't want to throw this out into a um, into the world and say this is easy. This is not. If you look at the image of George Floyd, within that image are images of other Black people who have been killed, mistreated, um, uh, and devalued. And so with that, I'm going to flip to the other side, which is a level setting of our conversation today, something that we need to um, understand and, and dialogue about, which is this. On the screen, the words Black Lives Matter are there. That for me is not a political statement. It is a statement of fact, it is a statement of truth, and it is a statement of value um, to highlight that Black people have been undervalued and, and that value needs to be, um, needs to be punctuated this time because we have systematically not done that. And so I understand that looking at these two images for some of you on this um, webinar might be difficult. And um, I submit for you that we are probably going to be doing a lot of difficult things both in this hour and then as we go forward generally based on what has happened. So now that I've gotten you to this level set, Let's talk about what has happened in our profession since George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Maude Arbery, and a myriad of other people have been killed and justice has not happened. Um, we have additional headlines, right, that say we're not just looking at what's happening externally. Oftentimes when I do training, I will say the walls of the building, when we used to be able to go into buildings, are porous. So everything that happens outside in our community um, also happens in our microcosm of the community. And the legal profession is not, is not different, right? Look at this, when Black Lives Matter demands changes, it's looking at law firms too, right? We're seeing that, guess what? You can't talk about systemic uh, racism externally and then say, um, I'm not going to prioritize the Black attorneys that work within our organization. It's incongruous and um, and it says a lot of words and not a lot of actions. And so today is about how do we use some of the words <clears throat> um, together? How do we experience this comfort to get to a different space? And we're thinking organizationally, but I'm sure that many of you will have questions about individual interactions. So I'll try to intersperse some, some feedback as, as well there uh, to, to help. And so I'm just going to go to the next slide. Again, level setting, <clears throat> you have a definition. There are a myriad of definitions on racism. I chose this one in order to uh, level set. This is not a training. This is a, uh, a webinar to discuss um, how to have these conversations. If I was gonna go into training, I would go deeper into this, but right now I'm gonna submit for you two definitions, one for racism, and then the next one will be uh, for what anti-black racism is. <clears throat> Prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. Anti-Black racism. Right. Anti-Blackness as being a two-part formation that both strips Blackness of value, so dehumanization, and systematically marginalizes Black people. This form of anti-Blackness is overt racism. Beneath this anti-Black racism is the covert structural and systemic racism, which predetermines the socioeconomic status of Blacks in this country and is held in place by anti-Black policies, institutions, and ideologies. So I, I would hope that I don't have to make a further case, um, even I've spoken to you about where we are in terms of systems in our own institutions and the, and the numbers of representation within our organizations, um, what, what has happened to us um, societally recently and before that, to say to you that um, America has an anti-Black racism problem. <clears throat> the world has an anti-Black racism problem. 
and the legal profession has an anti-Black racism. So we'll take a minute, take a deep breath in that, and then we're going to jump in. You will notice that I'm not going to say people of color. I'm not going to say minority. I'm not going to say um, diverse people. I'm going to talk about Black people in this presentation because the purpose of this is to talk about anti-Black racism and how we manage and support Black people within our profession and generally um, to this time and going forward. So you'll see one of the points, point number one is don't forget to focus on anti-Black racism. So yes, listen, I do diversity and inclusion work. All racism is terrible. It is terrible. But right now, we are at a, an inflection point where we are forced to reckon with as uh, Brian Stevenson says, that this country has not atoned for its inception, that we as a country are at, were based on the stealing of Africans from the continent brought here to be enslaved um, and all of the wealth, all of the structures in this country were built on that. And so that atonement has not happened and then there has been a silencing of wanting to address it. And so now, um, as what happened in, uh, in the civil rights movement, there's a wave to say, we have to focus on this now. So before I get into this, I'll just let you know. So I did what every good um, diversity inclusion consultant will do is I tapped into the resources of the people who are experiencing challenge right now. I put out a survey um, and shared it pretty much everywhere. I asked a lot of my, um, my my network to share this, to ask about what the experiences have been um, with having conversations about anti-Black racism, about Black people right now, and particularly within the past uh, eight weeks. And uh, over 150 people responded. There were a lot of good feedback, well, good in terms of, for this, I'll be able to give you a lot of information, but um, people have been suffering. And I'd be remiss to, before I jump into this, to not really say, listen, this is a trauma time. I know I talked about pandemic. I know I talked about what's happening with George Floyd, but just generally, we're all suffering, okay? And so I'm gonna show you some of the responses as we go through each of the steps that I received. There were a lot more than what I'm gonna show you, but I think that what the, uh, the points that I'll pull out in the quotes will highlight some of the points that I want to make. And I'll remind you, if you have questions as you go through, please do send them and I will be reviewing them at the end of the session. So in response to um, conversations on race internally, one of the quotes was, the discussion turned to internal DNI efforts and started to somewhat water down the definition of diverse groups from diverse groups, which derailed the discussion from the specific discussions about black people and racial injustices. It basically was the equivalent to all diverse people matter. Now, I look at that the same way I look when someone says to me, um, all lives matter, I agree with that. But I also agree at this time that saying, like I said at the beginning, Black Lives Matter is, is in response to the fact that it's not been what we have practiced. And in fact, for all any lives matter, we have to acknowledge that um, Black lives and, and other lives have not mattered. And that's why we have to say it loud. Keep it focused on black people and what we are doing to specifically support them, right? So this was a call to say, listen, we're narrowing down, we're watering down this content, we're watering down the focus of the conversations. Would have preferred to have a program or conversation targeted to black and brown employees. And we're gonna get into this a little more because there was a little bit of conflict in terms of what people wanted, which I hope I have narrowed down a little bit. So why is this important? As I said before, there's a current need to reflect on the experiences of Black employees. They're experiencing multiple pandemics, COVID-19, racial injustice, et cetera. So then in knowing that this is an issue, how can we focus on what can be done, right? And so this is not about people of color generally, although when you do diversity and focus on belonging properly, every initiative helps people generally within your, within your culture. But right now, right, what is the need for dialogue with Black employees um, to support Black employees generally? So anti-Black racism should be prioritized when developing diversity and inclusion initiatives. And this is the case. I mean, I can tell you in the last six weeks, my partner and I have received, I don't know, 
probably over 100 pieces of outreach where people are saying, listen, we have got to do a session on anti-Black racism and we have to talk about our structures. And we agree with that. But the first question we always ask is, well, what have you done already? Right? So in my mind, going from zero to anti-Black racism is a lot, especially because um, many of you on the, on the session, when I showed the the image of George Floyd, or when I put the image of Black Lives Matter on there, that it makes you have this sort of uh, this response of discomfort. And so we have to be thoughtful about what we want because I don't think any of us is going to be comfortable comfortable in this, and what and how we're going to get it. And that means being strategic in order to do so. So I'm layering this in conversations about anti-Black racism. It's okay to just listen and think about the experiences of black people and what they need. On the flip side, we have to be very cognizant of what our expectations are of black employees at this time. Now, when I when I say this, I don't mean, for example, if you engage a, a diversity consultant who's black like myself, I expect to engage in conversations about racism, anti-black racism, and all other areas in the spectrum of diversity. But your employees, Right? This is very different and it's a delicate, a delicate balance in terms of how you do this because I'll give you an example. I did a, um, a session for a Canadian company who said, you know, Paula, we need to have a conversation. We want to have a town hall about, um, about diversity. And I said, okay, is it about diversity or is it about black experience right now? And they were like, right, we want to talk about anti-black racism and what's happening to black people. And I said, okay. And they said, well, what we want to do is have seven employees sit on a panel and talk about how bad it's been for them. So I have a big problem with putting pain and black pain in particular on display in order to advance understanding for other people. Because it should be clear that the pain exists, right? And a lot of the conversations that I've had have been like, now I realize just how bad it is. Now I get it just how bad it is. And, and that's a privilege point, which we'll be discussing shortly. So here's some of the feedback from the survey about black people being expected to uh, to speak up and do the heavy lifting right now. I refuse to educate a white person on basic history. Read research, it's all online. Do not expect black colleagues to teach white colleagues. It was clear they targeted black employees to speak publicly. Tired of white people requiring black people to teach them. They need to do their own work. Now, as you are looking at this, you might again be feeling a little bit uncomfortable because A, there are terms on the screen, right? When we say white people, when we say black people, it automatically has this sort of us versus them. It's not, it's all of us. And what are we going to do about anti-black racism, right? And so if you think, well, my initial desire to have a conversation with a black employee or a black colleague was to hear what they're experiencing so I can understand. That, that makes sense, except that having to detail the pain, having to detail the slights, the microaggressions, the experiences is another form of trauma, right? It's very different that if someone says, I want to speak, I want to talk about um, what has happened to me and why we as an organization or why I as an individual feel like we need to focus on this right now. So the balance is, is wanting to engage with dialogue and making sure that it's actually in a, uh, a reciprocal thing as opposed to it being you trying to um, elicit information when you can find access to that information in other ways. Okay, so I hope that that is, is clearer. So looking at this, some recommended strategies. <clears throat> if you have folks who are in your organization who are black who want to volunteer their experiences and their feedback, honoring and listening to it is paramount. It is paramount because asking for that information and then not actually um, hearing it um, is another trauma. The second bullet point, compensate black employees for additional DEI anti-racism work. You might think to yourself, especially because, you know, I, I reached out to a lot of the partners in my network to say, you need to come and listen to this. You might think compensate. Oh, no. Um, yes, because most people are particularly if you're thinking about the legal context. They're there to lawyer, right? They're there to do the work of lawyering, which means business development, which means, you know, servicing clients, et cetera. 
DEI work is additional work. So if you're not giving people billable hours that are, are you know, that their DEI work can, can be credited for, um, and you're just expecting them to all of a sudden be uh, anti-racist experts <clears throat> um, and to put together committees and to do all of this work without compensation, it is again, an additional trauma. So in conversations around this, and I have these all the time, I'll hear partners will say, well, okay, great. We were gonna, we're gonna put together a committee and then they're gonna tell us what we should do. And yes, in terms of wanting to get feedback is great. Requiring them to do it, um, particularly your partners uh, and particularly your associates who can be detrimentally affected here um, is a challenge. And so you should be having dialogues uh, at the leadership level around what makes sense um, and having that engaging dialogue to say, how can we make this something that we are getting the information that we might need from you, right, about your own experiences, if you want to share them, about your recommendations, again, if you would like to share them without further burdening you in uh, an organization or in a system that already heavily burdens you as a Black employee, Black attorney. Okay. <clears throat> so, if thinking that the request is not to burden black people with having to explain to uh, other people who are not black uh, about what their experiences are, then it would be helpful for law firms and other organizations to provide educational resources to say, look, what we do as attorneys is we issue spot and we find the answers and we provide resources. So we're gonna turn that inwards and do that for ourselves, right? This is a really great way to say in our intranet, we're gonna provide compendiums, and they're all over the internet, of uh, things you can utilize in order to um, support yourself in your journey on becoming more um, educated around this issue. And that could be reading, video, podcasts, but it shouldn't be, we're gonna wait to have, you know, I'll use myself, Paula, as the internal employee to say, you know, it's, imp it's imperative that you watch the 13th today and we'll discuss it tomorrow. No, and again, if you do go watch the 13th, going on the Zoom the next day and saying, you know, Paula, I watched the 13th and now I get it, is also problematic. And I hope that you are thinking about questions you want to ask me about this at the end, because a lot of this is, it's about the weight that we are putting on the people who are in this sense, in, in this situation, have already been victimized, okay? And then training. So if we're to have a dialogue, right? If you think about this, you know, you don't start law school and then you go and litigate and, and hope that you know the best. You have to understand terminology. You have to understand the rules of engagement. And similarly with having effective training on what are the terms that we are utilizing with each other about the different things that we are talking about, particularly racism, anti-black racism, bias, white supremacy, um, privilege, all of these terms that make, make you do a little bit of this Effective training will provide a baseline that everyone can have uh, to reflect back on in terms of rules of engagement, right? If I say to you, you know, we need to focus on diversity. Everybody who is on this um, webinar will have a different concept of what that means. Because we use the word diversity in such a way that it has this um, weird, you know, I want to bring in more diverse, um, you know, employees. Okay, what does that mean? But I want to advance diversity. What does that mean? Well, we have a diverse candidate. So if you look at the definition of diversity, pretty much any room is diverse as long as the same people aren't in it, right? <laughs> However, it may not be as diverse as we want it to be. It may not be the diversity that we're looking for, and it may not speak to a lot of the silos or the um, blind spots that we might have in terms of specific area of diversity. Now, when we're thinking about inclusion and belonging, that's very different, right? Because you can have, you know, a law firm that has, I don't know, let's say, this, this is not, this does not exist anywhere, but I'm just going to throw this out. 20% black attorneys, right? And, and then say, look, we have diversity here, which it will be true, but do you have inclusion? Do you have belonging? Are your black employees, your black associates able to, um, you know, be supported, be mentored, get evaluations that help them to grow and, 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 and proceed upwards into the organization? Do they get, um, opportunities for business development? Do they get opportunities to get stretch assignments where they're learning new things so they get to go on client pitches, right? Looking at the structures of where the inequities are within our own systems is a helpful place to be 
um, in order to have these conversations. And training is a really good way to do that. And I will just say to you, um, video training does not work for lawyers. The end, it doesn't, because we are masters at multitasking. And if we're not focusing on it, you're not internalizing it. And I know that even as watching this, some of you may be doing 10,000 other things. It's our nature, it's the nature of how we are. But I would submit for you that when we prioritize things, when things are important to us, we do focus. And so let's do that. So don't be afraid of uncomfortable conversations. Even as I wrote this out, I thought to myself, who's not afraid of uncomfortable conversations, right? Um, I don't wanna have uncomfortable conversations with many people, but it's necessary. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of free advice from my therapist who says every session for the most part, growth begins where comfort ends. I'll repeat that. Growth begins where comfort ends. And if truly we're trying to be different here, and the hope is that we are. And I also know that some of you uh, who are listening may not be sure whether you're ready for that change, but the change is coming regardless of if we want to or not. And it's helpful to, to go with the wave as opposed to fighting it, but it will be uncomfortable. There will be conversations where people express their pain, express things that have happened to them that maybe you were involved in or the organization or the firm that will be uncomfortable. The question is, what will we do with that discomfort? So let's look at this in terms of some of the feedback. The conversations were very superficial, safe and measured, no uncomfortable conversations or full dive into the underlying issues. Right? This, this makes sense, but people don't want to do this, particularly organizationally, um, and it becomes hard. And we'll go into why it becomes even more challenging when it's done. I felt like something was missing, felt talked to and not talked with. Right now, that's hard, right? Because in, in, in any dialogue, you want to feel like you're part of the dialogue as opposed to um, being spoken to. Although I, I, I realize the irony of that because I'm speaking to all of you. <laughs> Played it safe, superficial and insincere. And I'll highlight the insincere piece of this. Um, it is very hard to express sincerity when you are in pain or you are uncomfortable. Um, but one place for us to do better is to just say, I, I know that uh, I may not get this right. I know that um, I can tell by the way that you're expressing whatever it is that you are experiencing pain. And I am, I, I am sorry for the pain that you're feeling. And, and I would, I'm hoping that we are able to dialogue so that we can both get to a place where we can continue to have these conversations and get better at this, right? It is, no one is expecting perfection, but we are expecting empathy and we're expecting dialogue and I'm going to get into that more in a minute. White colleagues inability to empathize, right? So I was in a conversation earlier with a white male law firm partner um, who essentially tried to silence me in a, in a phone conversation. And I, the irony of it in that, that what I do is advance dialogues around diversity and inclusion and the irony that he was reaching out to me for support in this and that he could not hear that um, what he had done and what he was currently doing on that phone call was silencing me. And it was easier for him to do that because of his privilege, right? So power power in terms of his role, he didn't expect to be challenged by someone who has my package, right? In terms of my face, my, my skin color, my gender, et cetera. Um, and it, it was a, a difficult conversation because I said to him, I can't get into this dialogue with you in the way that I want to because I actually have to go and speak to people about dialoguing right around anti-Black racism. And so uh, we have another call scheduled uh, on Monday, so that should be fun. Anywho, be genuine and listen to your Black coworkers, no matter how uncomfortable it make you feel. So this is every human being, and particularly in the work context, wants to be fully heard and fairly treated. And so if I say to you, I have been having a hard time. Um, you know, I know that we're all having these dialogues about race right now in the, within the firm, but it bothers me that now people understand that this is a bad thing, that, that, that we have been experiencing this for this long time, and now you get it, it bothers me. That may be hard for you to hear, but our initial way of reflecting when, when someone says, this thing happened is to get defensive. And I will submit for you, if we can do something right now, it is to say, I hear you. I hear you and I thank you for sharing, right? It doesn't mean that you agree and it doesn't mean that you understand, but it does honor and acknowledge that someone is telling you about their pain and telling you about their experiences. And at its baseline, hearing that 
um, honors their humanity and empathizes what their experiences are. So, as I mentioned, for change to happen, it's necessary to have difficult conversations. But right? we're not we're not going to get to any next step. Um, and again, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, some of us don't want to have these conversations. And I, I say us, but I mean some of other people because I do want to have this conversation. Um, they don't because it's hard and life is hard right now and life is always hard, but it's really hard right now. And this makes it harder. But imagine your wants not wanting to have these conversations, but not having the choice but to have these conversations, right? If it's your experience that you are experiencing um, black being being black and, and having to navigate anti-blackness and anti-black racism every single day. For someone to choose to not have these dialogues, it's a, it's really highlighting their privilege and the in and their ability to tap in and tap out when they can. Um, is part of the issue. If you don't feel uncomfortable, you probably aren't doing it right, right? We are going to hear, I often hear things where I say, oh, okay, let me let me sit with that for a minute and, and let's figure out um, how we can do this differently going forward. That's a muscle that I am continually building with myself as a diversity and inclusion expert because just because this is what I do doesn't mean that I'm not gonna have places in which I feel uncomfortable Particularly, you know, I've had dialogues where people will say, well, Paula, your experience is X because, you know, you, you're, you're a lawyer and you're a mother and you, there are places of privilege that you have even within your intersection of being a black woman that other people don't have. And I have to say, yes, I hear, I hear you, right? As opposed to being like, well, actually, right? If you, if you're mind thinking, well, actually in a conversation, you have to reset because it's not safe. It's not. So you will make mistakes. If you think about this, I always you know, tell people when we're talking about microaggressions and, and I apologize because again, like I mentioned, it's not a training, but a microaggression is essentially a bias based slight, um, which may seem sort of smaller on its scale. It's not where I say to you, you insert word here. It may be, you know, Paula, you're so articulate, which kind of has a, um, a, a, on the flip side, an expectation that I wouldn't be because I'm black and then maybe I'm a woman, et cetera. Um, where I will say to someone, what do you mean by that? Why, why did you think that saying articulate at that time was something that you should have done? 10 other people have spoken and you didn't say that about them. Now, it's not me saying that I'm not articulate because I know that I am, right? But it's, it's really wanting people to reflect and self-reflect as to why they may be using certain words. And a lot of it is bias related, right? So understanding that you will make mistakes and acknowledging when someone lets you know, because it is, it's very much a vulnerable space to be able to tell someone that they have hurt you or they have said something that um, was biased or racist or it, it insert a myriad of other things, that we will make mistakes. None of us are perfect. But we need to learn how to apologize and we need to learn how to internalize and then get better. And this is hard, right? This is relationship advice across the board, right? If you think about this, someone tells you, regardless of who it is, you have done X thing that has, has, has harmed me. Your initial what want to do is to say, no, I didn't, or I didn't mean to. But we have to remember that our intent is not always our impact. And this is probably one of the, the most important things that I'll tell you today is our intent, hopefully, and it's not always the case, but our intent should be to do right. And I said to you before, there's a lot of people who are saying, you know, right now, I'm just realizing that things are so bad. I did a presentation for the Association of Corporation Council, and it was five or four general counsel who were speaking, four black general counsel who were speaking about their experiences. And after moderating that panel, I got, I don't know, maybe five or six emails. The three of them were emails from general counsel, white general counsel, um, both women and men, who basically said, after watching that webinar, I understand now how bad it is. And I thought to myself, good, except that, wow, right? right. What we do is, like I said, we issue spot, we understand we're supposed to know environmentally what's happening and what's um, affecting our communities. And to be able to say, this is why I get it, it hurts, but I'm also like, I'm going to not lose this momentum and being able to say, now that you get it, now we have to have these conversations. Now we have to figure out what shifts we're going to make, both on an individual basis and organizationally in order to affect change, okay? So, if you are listening to debate, we have already lost. Like I said, if somebody is saying to you, my experience has been X, I have been 
not selected for client pitches. I have um, been, you know, not um, interacted with at events for, for the firm. I have felt like I don't, I didn't belong. And then you start off with, well, you know, I, I noticed that you don't, you don't speak up when, when those things happen, or, you know, there are ways that, you know, if you just sit back and let these things happen to you, that again, it's our nature, particularly within our profession to say, you should do X, Y, Z thing. Let us, you know, debate, but you cannot debate humanity. Right, and that's why I started off this presentation with saying Black Lives Matter. You see, my Black Lives Matter pin is on my lapel. It is not. It's not political. It is just a statement of fact, and it doesn't take away from anybody else's experiences. But it, it, it encourages you to focus right now on we have not done well and we need to do better. Okay. So again, I'll repeat. Listen to what Black voices have to say. So I, I did another presentation recently in which um, I said. To, it, was, it was all law firm partners. I said, hi, if all of you raise your hand or put your thumbs up on Zoom to indicate if you in the past year have ever had a black woman speak to you as an expert. I think there were maybe two thumbs. And what I said was part of the way that we kind of highlight and priorities on, on, on what is valuable is in who we engage as well, right? And who we look at as experts and who we will listen to. Right, so think about that because all of these things, if you look at your network, if you look at who you engage with all the time and the voices and the, the, the interactions are all the same, then you're not gonna get into that uncomfortable space. And I'm not, I'm not at all talking about politics because that would bear this off into a very dangerous place, <laughs> but, but I am talking about perspective. I have lots of people in my network that are not, they don't have the same sort of value ideology as me, but we can dialogue uncomfortably and understand where those perspectives are and shift a bit, shift a little bit. And that's what I'm asking for all of you to do is to hear about experiences because a lot of times those places come from pain. They come from, look, if you don't understand that I've experienced pain, then we can't have this dialogue. I shared with a group the other day that since and the pandemic has started. I have lost three family members to COVID-19. My mother-in-law had COVID-19. Um, I thought because of everyone slashing budgets in terms of their um, what they were going to do in, in terms of training, that I was going to have to very much rethink my business. And then George Floyd was killed. And then all of a sudden, it was this this re-engagement around around diversity, around um, anti-black racism. And I thought to myself, the irony that this has had to happen in order for that shift to occur, but then thinking about my individual experience, I'm still in the middle of grief. I'm still in the middle of pain, but I also understand that these dialogues have to happen in order to make the world better, not just for my children and for me, but for your children, whoever you are on the, on the other part of this. And if you don't have children, for your friends' children for the rest of the world, for the continuation of us to do this better, because we have not done this well. We have not. Recognizing your privilege. So I've started to allude to this already, right? We, we all have privilege, but there are some privileges that, um, that are paramount right now. Again, if you can say, I have never had to think about anti-Black racism in my life. I've never had to think about the Black experience. You have a privilege. I don't have that choice to do so. Uh, black associates and partners within your firms or organizations don't have that choice. They have to think about the experience of being Black pretty much first, because no one is going to ask um, you know, what your degree is before they decide whether or not that you should be um, arrested or treated differently because of your skin color. And that really shifts how we can navigate. Um, and at its baseline, it is of course not fair and it's terrible. But if you don't have to interact with that, if you think about how not having to do so, how you can use the privilege that comes innately, right? Many of our privileges, we don't have to do anything but exist in order for them to occur. And as I speak about privilege, I know that some of you are like, oh, I, well, I, I don't have, yes, you do, you have privilege and it doesn't mean that you may not have had a bad life or hard life or a hard life, but it means that some of your characteristics, some of your state of being is not going to be as hard because of those privileges. It, it, it is, you can have an education privilege, you can have a privilege of race and skin color, you can have a privilege of gender, gender expression, 
Um, you can have lots of privileges. I have a privilege that no one ever talks about, but I'm right handed. But it's a privilege. It's a small one, trust me, but it is. Um, but when we think about that, if we don't think about the being called out about privilege as being a bad thing, but it's thinking, yes, you have this privilege. How can you then use it to right the wrongs that we're experiencing? To 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 advance equity versus um, sort of sit with injustice and inequity. Okay. So then also, like I mentioned before, showing empathy and being understanding. These are all kind of baseline things in every conversation. And while much of what I'm going to talk about going forward is organizationally from the perspective of leaders and diversity professionals within organizations, giving them some feedback. These pieces here are really where I want you to focus on in terms of what you can individually do better in order to advance dialogues around race, around anti-Black racism, and with Black colleagues, okay? So here we go. Do utilize an in-house diversity professional and or hire an outside consultant. And so, yes, this is self-serving, but it's also something that I know is the best practice. So I'll say this. It's in two parts for a reason. Many law firms and other organizations have diversity professionals that need to have the freedom to be able to say what they need to say and to advance um, dialogues in the way that will help the organization, but gatekeepers are preventing them from doing so. Sit with that for a minute. If you have a diversity professional who is in your organization who does not have direct access to the managing partner or your C-suite, you have to shift and look at where you might be perpetuating a system of inequity within your want to advance equity within your organization. The end, hard stop. Many of the organizations, law firms included, who engage me and my partner in my business, hire us to say the same things that their in-house diversity professionals have already been saying. But because we are an outside in, uh, an outside entity, it's looked at differently. And in my mind, we have to think about how we utilize resources and how we um, really uh, highlight expertise and utilize it in a way that will benefit us. And so if you are not honoring and valuing and centering your diversity professional who is in-house, that's a shift that you should do immediately. Immediately. Feel free to tweet me on that one. Now. <laughs> There are some things that went wrong. Again, when I call, I pulled for some feedback in terms of the, the situations in terms of conversations organizationally. Very happy that my company retained a DEI consultant rather than recycle slash hack a playbook from human resources. DEI is a topic for specialists, not generalists. I wish we brought in an outside consultant to coordinate and facilitate the discussions. Would have preferred an outside facilitator so that black employees did not feel compelled to speak would have also liked a clear format and goal for the meeting. This is essentially the people saying, you did this wrong, right? Like this didn't go as well as it could have gone because, you know, and it's really been shocking to me where people have reached out and said, well, you know, we did a town hall um, because we wanted to give people space to have conversations and it went terribly wrong and we're not sure why. Well, flipping back to what I said before, if you are having dialogues around race um, around anti-blackness, uh, around bias, and you haven't done any training, any level setting on language, you're setting it up to fail. And if you're not creating a safe space in which people are not being put on display for their pain um, without any um, outlet, without any space for them to feel safe, again, you're creating um, situations in which you're making it worse. You are amplifying the trauma as opposed to making it better and putting steps in place. So. So here we go. Having a dedicated internal voice and valuing that dedicated internal voice is priority, should be priority number one. Okay. If you engage someone else, it is helpful because it's a non biased outside voice who can say what needs to be said. And again, you know, as, as of someone who coaches white um, men often, sometimes they will use me in that situation as well to say, look, I don't feel comfortable with saying this yet, which is a whole nother story, but I want you to come in and say it so that everyone can hear and then we can engage with it. When you utilize any diversity professional, whether internal or external as a resource, the strategy that's employed should come and be well thought out, right? Not reactionary. I'm often, my partner and I are often called in to be the cleanup people 
or something has already gone wrong because it was reactionary. So, for example, you know, you have there's a lot of law firms that have had their black associates and black partners who are, you know, written manifestos and made demands and other organizations to say, we have to do this. And then, you know, the, the partnership will say, okay, well, we're going to put together a town hall and it should be fine. And as much as, as lawyers don't like risk, I'm shocked always when they do things that are risky, such as this, which is to not be thoughtful about how to do these things. When you say, let's think about how we're going to do this and then do it, right? The, it is better, it is safer for everyone else, right? Again, thinking about what is important here. You need someone who's an expert in terms of facilitation, who's thinking about what happens if someone uses a, you know, a piece of language that is charged. What if someone asks a question? What if someone says all lives matter and all of the black associates flip out? What do you do? Well, you set it up so that hopefully that's not going to occur because you've done some of this based on education. You have prioritized making sure the way that the dialogue is engaged with is, is one that is supportive of people. But I, I do know, and I'm sure many of you, because a lot of you I know have filled out the survey, that's not what you've experienced. And having these dialogues must be safe or you will make it worse. Make sure that leadership is visible and vocal and ensure the entire organization is involved. So many of you have seen all of the statements. I mean, it's so for me, I'm like, my goodness, I never thought I would see law firms say Black Lives Matter as a outward statement. Like it just seemed to me like, like that Shangri-La over there that we would never quite get to. But then it's kind of been like, okay, number one, there are people who are saying it and they're also saying Black Lives Matter and here are things that we're gonna do to prove it. Then there are people who are saying Black Lives Matter, please hopefully no one will talk about what has happened internally because we haven't shown that Black Lives Matter um, have mattered. And then there are people who say Black Lives Matter and we're going to donate, you know, a billion dollars to all of these nonprofits, but we're not gonna do anything internally. Again, when you think about strategy and you think about what the conversations are internally and, and how to make sure you do this properly, it has to be strategic, looking at all the different stakeholders, looking at the feedback you've received, and then acting. So we, the staff, created a, a task force, but little guidance from the administration. The only thing I considered wrong was the silence of the executive team. It, it was noticeable to staff. Also, there hasn't been much follow-up since our first few initial discussions. I would like to hear more from our management committee. We, the Black Affinity Group, had a small group discussion with the executive committee. I think the conversation should be had across the firm. Yeah, me too. And this is not to say that there shouldn't be, um, you know, affinity-based dialogues that occur first. I think that is a helpful thing because you want to have alignment and understanding about what the feedback is and what the experiences are. But then, yes, if we're going to topple anti-Black racism internally and externally, it has to be done collaboratively because if the Black employees, Black associates, Black partners could do it on their own, it would have already been done. Right? This is where that privilege and that power and, and the thinking about how to shift, shift these systems comes in from a collective standpoint as opposed to from just the grouping that has experienced this. It was voluntary to attend and noticeable that many white male peers skipped the dialogue. So I know that in lots of organizations, people don't like mandatory training or they don't like mandatory town halls or meetings, but I'm telling you this. If you give the people the option to say, hey, at three o'clock, would you like to be uncomfortable? Show up then, they're not gonna show up, <laughs> right? It's not, it's not gonna be where you're like, yes, I would like to be uncomfortable at three o'clock, so I'm gonna be there with bells on, no. So when you make things mandatory, although it will be uncomfortable, you need to make sure there's an understanding of baseline of people hearing about experiences and having the ability to dialogue after that. So again, having leadership engaged in dialogues, making sure internal and external commun uh, communication is aligned and is not making promises that cannot be acted on. Um, similarly to what I was saying about people, you know, having these conversations and coming back to us and saying, can you help us fix what happened? There have been people who have made statements and say, we are going to, you know, make sure that, that equity has happened in 45 minutes. You know, right? like, that's not, that doesn't, you have to look at the systems, right? You have to figure out what the experiences have been of your black employees. And then you have to see where are the barriers and challenges that existed. And then what are you gonna put in terms of strategies to affect that change? If you don't do that, 
then your promises are words and they're empty. And that, um, you know, has much more pain and involvement that doesn't have to happen. So again, what I said before, this is really saying we're going to have space for those dialogues around affinity that need to happen then encourage organizational dialogues and communicate what's already happened, right? Say we, we knew it was important for us to have a conversation with the Black Affinity Group first before we brought the organization together because at this time we're prioritizing the experiences of our Black, right? Because it makes sense. Because if you look at the news, if you look at life, right? It, that's what's happening right now. That need to prioritize is there. So create a safe environment, for open dialogue and meaningful conversations. Questions were very open and some even about direct problems with managers. Some people did not feel comfortable talking with their managers present. This we see this a lot, right? This is why we had to think about the strategy around how you encourage people to dialogue. It's important the speakers volunteer to speak and are not required and push into it. This is again that prioritizing pain. We want to make sure that we're not making the, the pain of our black employees something that we're spotlighting and, and making them um, uh, display for us. It was an empty conversation. The forum was not a safe environment to truly share the fear, rage, and pain I feel as a black woman. I would have liked some anonymous polling to bring more voices into the conversation, right? Thinking about, you know, everyone come to this town hall and say all the things that you feel about anti-black racism when most, most of our cultures are not prepared for that. You need to have tools that will allow for people to share their experiences and share their feelings without being put on the on the display. So again, having a safe environment, hearing different perspectives gets everybody involved and allows you to get a playbook for what needs to be addressed, right? That this is what the information you need from everyone is. And that comes from individual dialogues as well as organizational dialogues. So recommendation is to have separate sessions when you can, right? To to understand at different levels what some of the experiences have been, as I repeat over and over again, require people to speak up, but provide them with opportunities to do so. If you have used anonymous polling, get some of those themes. And then the final point before I go into, I hope the very significant and robust Q&A, and I get to pull these slides down and look at myself because I can't see you, but the point is, is this. Basically, people are saying, hey, you did a lot of talk, but what's going to happen now? What are the next steps? Right? Too many companies are talking the talk, but really are doing nothing to make meaningful changes in disparity and diversity. We have got to do something. So here, you must be responsive. If you're going to ask the question of your affinity groups, your black employees, and then do nothing with those dialogues that occur, again, it's additional trauma. Be transparent of what is needed, what's been requested, and then how you can do it. Don't promise the moon when you can't give that yet, but say we're working on this and then talk about the different steps that you're going to take, okay? Looking at some of the systems that you will find inequity in terms of how you're treating your black employees and other diverse employees. Um, when you're looking at the composition or if there is not a diversity committee, what are you doing with recruiting? What about pay, retention and promotion? And then prioritizing training. Don't have people out there flagging around trying to figure out how to manage this themselves. Get resources. And then my final point is the committing to active and engaged allyship. Now, I can imagine that you've seen probably 60 different compendiums about how to be a good ally and, um, and what all you can do now. And I'll say this, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. What you need to do if you want to be an effective ally at this time is to take it upon yourself to educate yourself about the issues and then commit to not being stagnant. Right? We, there's work to be done and that's work in tandem with people and that's work on your own. Um, many people have come to me and said, Paula, this, this is all these lists, it's just a lot. And I said, just start with one thing, shift your perspective, shift your networks, right? Really commit to being uncomfortable. And I know even saying that it sounds like, oh, it's not something I want because I'm comfortable enough to be in this pandemic. But I'll tell you this, if black lives don't matter for you, they will matter for you. Right? You're going to be affected by this regardless of if you want to or not. And so I say be a part of the solution as a part of as opposed to being a part of resistance to solution. And so um, I am going to put the slides back up and then take some questions. See what we have here. All right, maybe I won't. Okay. Yeah. 
maybe not. Okay, um, Q and A. I don't see anything. In the Q &A. What questions do you all have for me? Um, can you story? hear me? I can hear you, but my mouse is not allowing me to navigate on this for some reason. So, uh -oh. let's let's go ahead and tell me what I need to answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you actually have some very good questions here. Okay. Um, and so the first one, if virtual training doesn't work for lawyers and we want to do something now in the age of COVID-19, what is the answer? So the answer is you can do training that's live, that's not a web, that's not a, uh, a video training. So my point is, is you have to have interactive training in order for there to be um, some solutions, some inter engagement. What, I, what my request was is to not encourage people to, to you know, press a video and hope that it's going to change your culture. That doesn't work. Thank you. Let me see. You can see them now? I can. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there they are. Okay. Thank you. I'll go back you. Okay. Uh, due to scarcity of voice, okay, wait, that doesn't come all the way through, so I'm not sure what that says. I fully. I see that. Do you recommend one-on-one -on -one discussions or group discussions? I recommend both. I think that we have to um, to learn how to engage in, in on an individual basis and and going back to that point of being wrong in um, in our impact, but right in our intention, right? It's we want to be able to do this better, right? To say, I know that this is hard. How can we do this? And if you know that you've done something wrong, if someone says to you, look. When you said insert the other thing when you called me, I don't know, insert word that was not okay. You have to hear it, reflect on it, and then do better. But that's life lessons. That's, that's not just about race and anti black racism, right? That is just what we should be doing to be better in general, but we haven't been. And, and I think that that's where we, um, we have been failing. And so, what my hope is that this new momentum says we're going to do better here, right? We are, we are destined to have difficult conversations. We have to learn how to navigate them differently. Um, I'm a consultant and I have a huge passion about DEI work. However, I am white and I have had some folks tell me to stay in my lane. I want to be an ally and I want to push for change. How do I respond when people think it's not my role to do this work? Well, I mean, I think so the, the, it is your lane. It's all of our lanes. What, what I heard from, from the context was, is that perhaps they were not asking for you to navigate around anti-blackness. And again, this is a hard one for me because I've had a lot of people reach out to be like, Paula, we need somebody black to talk about anti-blackness. And I feel like, yes, and, right? If you are versed in the history of racism, and particularly in this country, the experiences of black people, of course you can navigate it. So maybe what this is an opportunity for collaboration, right? So you know, because of the way bias works on all of our sides, sometimes the messenger needs to look and needs to align with our, our biases in order for us to hear. And that's challenging, but it's also true. My my request for you is not to not be, you, you have a lane. And the lane is to use that privilege, right? To know that when you go into spaces in which white ears are listening, maybe you may be heard in a different way that allows you to advance um, the, the fight against anti-black racism in a robust way that I might not be able to. What are your specific recommendations for hosting effective race conversations internally? Um, thank you for that. They, and, and, and hoping you're talking about in the group perspectives, my my recommendation is number one to provide a safe space. So to not just have opportunity for people to speak or to utilize the chat, but to have provided feedback either in real time or prior to about experiences, because then you can utilize and kind of talk about those things, even if the person themselves doesn't have to say, you know, I experience microaggression every single day, right? Like that's the balance, and then to have a trained facilitator to navigate. Right? The, the issue with these dialogues is that if you're putting group dialogues together, there will inevitably be somebody who is not quite there on the spectrum of understanding yet, who may say something and doesn't get it. And, and that's okay, but you don't want to inflict additional harm on the people who have already been victimized. So it's a very delicate balance, and that's why I recommend so deeply that we have to use trained facilitators and to set up safe spaces for these dialogues. Um, can, I, can I take one more, one last question? Okay, I'm hearing no answer. Paula, oh, okay. I think I you can? can take a few extra minutes. I know we're going over, and if people have to leave, they can. Perfect. But as we're looking at these questions, 
they're very pop questions and mm -hmm. so please um as much as you can answer as many as you can and for okay. those who want to leave we appreciate you attending and we understand oh paula give them the cle code oh, in case sure. you have to leave and I they totally to forgot that. i apologize um the cle code is S as in Sam, S as in Sam, 8119. I'll repeat, S as in Sam, S as in Sam, 8119. My, my, my want to be in my extrovert space and talk to y'all, let me not look at my notes, I apologize. Um, so I will continue to answer some of the questions. How, many, how much education would you say our executives need before putting them in a listening session with an employee affinity group as the first step before the broader organizational conversation? So, well, th th this is sort of a two-part question for me. There is an expediency in terms of the, the affinity groups needing to be heard. And so one of the things that I've been recommending is to have a listening session where it is not the uh, purpose of the uh, employees sharing their experiences, but to have um, them responded to at that time. It is simply an opportunity for leadership to hear so that they can be better informed. And then what happens from there is you take what you've learned and then you use that as foundation for dialogues on, on the side, right? This is where I've been in that coaching space. Um, then to figure out what to do next, because so many times leaders have not, particularly law firm leaders have not been trained and and I think it's a lot to ask to say, okay, you know, it's been six weeks since George Floyd died and, and everybody needs you to, you know, kind of be well-versed and be able to speak about this in a way that shows your passion and your allyship. It's a lot. And we have to remember that, you know, partners are people too, managing partners are people too, leaders are people too, and to meet them where they are. That doesn't mean we're not going to um, hold them accountable to what they say. It doesn't mean that we're not going to push them to be uncomfortable, but to say the purpose of this initial dialogue is just for us to hear I think is also very powerful and it sets up how you're facilitating it, right? Like this is not, you know, you know, the firm is racist, answer me. It's not that, that might come later, but it's not, you know, I'm being facetious, but it's just not the initial conversation. Um, yes, this recording will be available and I hope that you'll share it with your friends and colleagues. Uh, more importantly, what are the important lessons for them to understand so they don't become defensive personally or on behalf of the organization? So. This, this is really, I think, one of the hardest parts. Let's take this to a human level. We become defensive because we are not taught how to well communicate when we feel pain from a very young age, right? We're taught to lash out or to be like, what are you doing? So if we can just, as a part of our practice, be able to hear constructive feedback, that's, that's what this is, right? We have not done well. And to say, I hear what you're saying and what I want to do is to do better going forward. So my task at this time is going to be to learn more because that's my role. I have to do that. And then I want to continue to engage. I want to hear your feedback. Should you want to give it to me and let's continue. And then we're going to make commitments. We're going to put resources in place in order to do X thing, right? There's, there's different things you can do, but it's not, you know, it's not that we're requiring people to be perfect in this. We're not. But we have to be able to apologize. We have to be able to understand that there's going to be a, a initial response when when the people, the identities, the organizations that we connect with or we connect with are challenged because they have racist structures. But I was in a dialogue the other day. I said there's not any organization in this country that does not have racist structures, and that's hard to hear. But we live in a racist society, and so all of the privileges, all of the different systematic, systemic inequities that occur, right, that they, they don't stay outside, they seep into our spaces, they seep into our perspectives, and that's why we have to root them out. Um, do you have recommendations for real change that companies could do right away to deal with lack of black people in leadership roles in their company? Well, I, I think, there's a couple things. Number one, you want to look internally. Oftentimes people will say, we don't have any black people, so we must go recruit outside. And sometimes that's the right, um, that is the right thing to do. But many times, one of the places in which um, anti-black racism has been displayed is that you're not prioritizing and seeing the people who are already in your space. Right? <laughs> so, so looking to see how can we mentor, how can we sponsor, how can we amplify the people who already are here so that we can then use people who already have subject matter expertise about our culture and elevate them. And not so that they are a token, but so that they are well supported so they can thrive in the organizations. Um, and hi, Serena. <laughs> um, what do you do to have a mindful as opposed to only a 
around the time of annual facilitated training. Uh, so in my mind, at every management training, uh, every management meeting or management meeting, diversity and inclusion should be a part of that, but right? it should be on the actual agenda. What are we doing? Where are we? What are the deliverables? What have we done? That shows it's a priority, right? It cannot be that we're like, oh, well, hopefully, you know, they won't remember that we gave them the day off last year on Juneteenth. No, no, no. This has to become a part of who we are. Right? If not, then we're really not, we're talking the talk and not walking the walk. And that is not going to be allowed anymore. It has to be that we do this differently. What can firms do? Well, okay, so great, I have that. A weekly email tip management messaging. So, you know, there's a lot of places you can have, you know, information on the internal, on the intranet. There can be, you know, if you have a diversity and inclusion committee, that can be a part of messaging, you know, your internal communications, a part of their, um, you know, checklist of when they're doing communication should be, what is the diversity and inclusion lens of this? What what are we doing, saying, and how are we perpetuating this in our, within our, um, our firm or organization? Those are some of the things that you do when you have a DEI lens on the work that you do. And, and you're particularly thinking about um, anti-blackness, right? How do we put together, you know, there's been a lot of organizations who are putting, you know, bringing speakers in to speak about anti-blackness, you know, putting together panels where you may have clients and um, folks within your organization that's facilitated by someone else to speak about experiences in a way that's not just the pain, but it's the pain plus the, the, um, the actual strategies that you should employ. Um, Thank you very much. And okay. Uh, okay. Okay, I see that. What do you do when the people in charge of diversity of your firm are clueless and have no idea what they're doing, but that's who's in charge? Wow. Um, that's hard. That's hard. Um, there are you're gonna take me into my mountaintop about this. It's it is very challenging because oftentimes the people who are supposed to be experts in this space. They're supposed to be expert in the space, and if they're not, um, it can be very detrimental. It can be it can cause much more pain. And so, one of the ways to use employee engagement surveys or to use anonymizing tools when they're utilized is to get the the responses out that you need to without it being connected to you. And one of those things might be, you know, I'm I'm feeling very challenged in this space because um, I don't believe that some of the uh, expertise that's needed in order to um, advance this is, you know, lives here. Um, but that's a difficult one. Maybe we want to connect offline about that. Um, and before I, I continue some of these other ones, I want to, my final recommendation to all of you is please connect with me on LinkedIn. Please, please, please. One of the ways that I am trying to advance um, conversation about anti-Black racism is I want to be a resource for you. I want to be able to show you some of the, the things that I'm doing, speaking about some of the articles that I'm posting so I can be an information source. And I love social media for that. So let's connect and tell, tell me that you're on this webinar. So let's do that. What advice would you give? Oops, sorry, Dr. Stop. This is no, yeah, this is me interrupting you. So at 310, I'm looking at these questions. They're really good questions. Mm -hmm. And I can easily see us going another 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So Here's, uh, I, I, you know, I got to put you on the spot since 300 and some people are watching, so I can yeah. ask now. Yeah. What do you think about us doing a question and answer session, me, you, and I give people it. an opportunity to come back and ask some of these questions? And we can schedule this as soon as possible based on your ability. <laughs> done, 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 done. And I, I love collaborating with you, so that that's an easy response for me. And yeah. I do see there's really great questions coming. And I think that we can share the recording and then hopefully have even more people come and ask us questions in, in that next session. So yeah, I think it's a great idea. And then also somebody needs the CLE code again. Yes, ma'am. All the numbers. That would be SS as in Sam Sam 8119. SS 8119. Okay. What do you do if you are at an organization that, that has not even acknowledged the current social climate? So I guess my first response should not be leave. But, um, but uh, I wrote an article that's on my that's on inclusionstrategy.com, our website that says if you that you must say something, and I, I would share that with my, your internal, um, your internal folks. If you have not said anything right now, um, then it's problematic. The actual doing something piece is part two, but you must have it. Not like this is not um, a moment; it's a movement. And, and, and organizations that are not acknowledging the movement will not survive. That, that's my answer to that. 
Um, okay, so I think that we can end now then Corey, because we're going to now take all of these questions and rock and roll them into another session, which I'm so excited about everyone. I am going to thank you so much for spending time with me. As I mentioned, as a, an extrovert, I love just knowing that you all are there. Um, even if I can't see you. Um, and I honor your wanting to even think about this because we do need to do so. I wish you all well. Have a relaxing and thoughtful and introspective weekend and be well. Thank you very much, Paula. We appreciate you, your generosity, your wisdom, your time. Thank you everybody for joining this. Check the website for additional webinars that are coming up. We've got two next week and two the week after and two the week after. So. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks, Paula. Bye bye, everyone. Mike, are you there? Mike, anybody? Just us? <laughs>